Ice Age world wasn't all about ice. The oceans were 400 feet lower, exposing 10 million square miles of warm coastal plains. I've been scouring these lost lands, and off the coast of India, I've found mysterious monuments and cities that historians think shouldn't exist. In this film, I'm heading east to explore flooded structures around Japan and to find out who might have been around to build them before what we know of as civilization began. I've witnessed a dramatic underwater discovery off India's northwest coast. Ancient cities, 4,000 years older than any others so far discovered. Artifacts date the site to 9,000 years ago, and they could prove the existence of a lost urban civilization that I've been looking for for 10 years. In Taiwan, I've dived on an underwater wall that's clearly man-made and built when this part of the world was dry land and joined to mainland China. In Japan, too, I've come across an amazing structure that was last completely above water 10,000 years ago. If it is man-made, it's further proof for the existence of civilized peoples when historians and archaeologists say that none existed. I'd been called one of the lunatic fringe for advocating unorthodox theories, but some experts welcome new angles of attack on old problems. If this monument would be man-made totally or in part, it would be a very, very great finding, in compar comparable maybe to to well-known monuments like, let's say, Stonehenge. Some of the best discoveries are the lunatic fringe. The problem with scholars is they get like this. And that's why I say my students ask more better questions than the archaeologists do. My underwater adventures start in Japan, where the tiny island of Yonaguni marks the southern tip of the Ryukyu chain of islands. What I want to do in Japan is to find out if the underwater structures at Yonaguni are man-made and who built them. Because its builders might have a connection with the lost civilizations whose traces I've been following in other parts of the globe. I first heard of the Yonaguni mystery on a visit to Japan in 1996. I had just published a book which argued the case for a lost civilization. Quite a few Japanese came up to me at lectures and said, did I know that there were structures underwater off the island of Yonaguni? Then I was shown photographs. I became intrigued. I decided that I had to learn to dive in order to see them. Since 1997, I've put in something like 200 dives here in all kinds of conditions. And though I love diving, I haven't been doing this for fun. I want to be sure that the underwater mystery is solved. To even begin to make my case, I need scientific evidence of the effects of sea level rise in this part of the Pacific. Huge tracts of land were inundated in the region at the end of the Ice Age, as striking new research now shows. The orange areas show the part of the land that was exposed about 20,000 years ago. Dr. Glenn Milne of Durham University in the north of England is a world expert on sea level rise at the end of the Ice Age. If you take a look at Japan up here, mm. the North Island was connected to the mainland. All that area was flooded within about 10,000 years. Where you see the dramatic changes are up here. We're looking at a, a completely filled in sea. 
But the question that studies of sea level rise can't answer is who, if anyone, lived here 10,000 years ago and what were they capable of doing? So I really began to take Yonaguni seriously when I found that there were people in Japan at the time of the great floods at the end of the Ice Age. Archaeologists are uncovering a people with amazing artistic and technical skills, in the right place at the right time to have carved a structure that's now underwater. But they've been dismissed as primitives, incapable of such tasks. My first step is to find out whether there's anything on land in any way similar to the underwater structures of Yonaguni. It turns out that there are plenty to choose from. I'm in the Asuka Valley in central Japan to see this megalithic burial chamber called Ishibutai. Megalithic sites made from large stones are normally associated with ancient Europe like Stonehenge in England. Typically, they're thousands of years old. Some of the large stones used here dwarf anything used at Stonehenge. One weighs almost 100 tons and was brought from 10 miles away. This wonderful megalithic chamber of Ishibutai is a mystery in itself. But there's a bigger mystery surrounding all structures like this in Japan. How old are they? Generally, archaeologists put these structures at about the 7th century AD. And they may well be right. But I think there's more to the story. I want to find out just how far back into prehistory it's possible to trace such stone carving skills, to see if I can connect Japan's megalithic monuments with the mysterious sites I found underwater. But the whole quest would be pointless if Yonaguni's just a freak natural rock outcrop. That's why I've invited the German geologist Wolf Wichmann to dive with me. He's reported in Der Spiegel magazine that the Yonaguni structure is 100% natural. If he's right, I'm wasting my time. Let's ascend the sheer wall in front of the main terrace. There's, uh, in our first dive, I plan to show Wolf several distinct areas of the Yonaguni structure at what's called a Seki point. We may be lucky today, but in order to get back to this... For ease of identification, I've given each of them names. The pool, the main terrace, the twin megaliths, the turtle, and so on. If the pool is uh, suffering from too much swell... I, I see it's near the surface. It's very near the surface. It's in five meters or less. We'll then uh, switch that to the turtle. We stick pretty much to plan, descending at once to what looks like a flat pathway running along the base of the main structure at a depth of about 85 feet. From there, I lead the way up the sheer south face of the structure. 50 feet beneath the waves, we come to a stone platform that directly overlooks the pathway. Wolf investigates a set of huge geometrical steps which tower above us. It looks as if immense quantities of rock must have been removed from the entire platform in order to expose these steps. we swim past another series of further terraces to the upper platform of the structure in just 15 feet of water. We make it eventually to the structure that I call the pool, a basin in the surface of the rock which is curved and weathered on one side, clean-edged and angular on the other. I think these three holes were originally man-made and much shallower, then later widened and deepened by natural potholing processes.
Eastwards again, we drop down into deeper water where the turtle lies spread out on its own platform. Wolf isn't impressed by any of this. Taking into account that there have been four or five different forces of weathering and erosion, you will find an explanation for almost every feature, every pattern you can find there. It's true the structure would have been eroded by the weather when above water, pounded by waves as sea level rose, smashed by rocky debris in the strong currents and even penetrated by small sea creatures. What I saw up to now could be explained by a natural forces to be done. It is surprising that you find all these dedicated spots so close together, but it is possible. I don't know enough about geology to argue with Wolf about this, but I know a man who does. He's an internationally renowned marine geologist, Professor Masaki Kimura of Japan's University of the Ryukyus. Yonaguni's been his special research project since 1995, and he's staked his reputation on it being man-made. If this has been made by nature, it is very difficult to explain this road. If this part was cut by the wave action, yes. so this must uh, exist here, but there is no road here. Yes. As if this is all caused by wave action with blocks falling, which they must have fallen, right. then they should be here, and they aren't. There's not a mass of rubble, there's a clear uh, yes, but pathway. Why it, would that be? It, be? it depends. Over 10, 100,000 of years, mm. smashing all these waves against that mm. coastline, I think they would be able to cut even big blocks. Well, they're certainly not strong enough to move large stones, because the stones are still sitting there. The ones at the end, for example, there's one here, but nothing in the middle. So you, not you, only this part, all of this part round carved. And completely clear of stone. The question why here's nothing, but here's something, mm. this is interesting. That's the curious yeah. thing for me. Wolf's argument makes no sense to me, because if he's right, we'd expect to find masses of fallen stone on the path itself. In fact, it's free of debris. On our next dive, Wolf agrees to take another look at the path underwater. Soon we're swimming west along the pathway Kimura and I think must have been artificially cleared. I show Wolf some rectangular sockets on the edge of the path. I don't see how they and other similar features within a mile from here could have been made by nature as Wolf maintains. The second ramped stone path curves up between two parallel walls 300 feet further to the west, and close by is a narrow tunnel. Let's, let's pass through here. The tunnel is aligned on two huge megaliths stacked side by side in the northwest corner of the monument. I've been in front of these massive megaliths dozens of times before. I'm always struck by how powerful and imposing they are. I can't help feeling that they must have been arranged here intentionally. But Wolf still isn't convinced. After the dive, Wolf wants to investigate the layers of rock above water. 
he goes climbing on the shore near to the underwater structure. We are here in the same sandstone which forms the monument underwater. We are trying to find pattern which show us the way of shaping this formation underwater. What is interesting is the monument shows monolithic structure a bit like this, consisting of layers like this being upright. These monoliths underwater are um, positioned in a sort of canyon. Two layers could have fallen down and stuck into this canyon. They fall vertically uh, into a chasm, right. which holds them in place. Right. That's, that's your argument. So what's bothering me is why I can't find big slabs of rock ah, see, lying yeah. directly underneath here. When the sea level was at, at the stage to influence this area, it could have lifted and pulled away parts from here. They fell down then mm -hmm. here. But if parts of the structure had broken off and fallen down naturally, you'd expect to see them here at the bottom. In fact, the path is miraculously clear. I agree with Japanese geologist Professor Kimura that their absence points to human involvement. I, I saw the face. But no matter how hard I argue each anomaly with Wolf, he puts up a geological counter explanation. Sharp edged steps and flat terraces. Smooth paths, corridors with guttering. Square holes, rounded holes. Intricate pools cut down into the rock. And finally, monoliths aligned on the opening of a tunnel. All these things, Wolf says, were shaped by local erosive forces and are 100% natural. None, he says, have ever been modified by man. All he'll admit is that it's an amazing place. I, from my view, would say it's a natural miracle. Everybody who's uh, trying to learn something about forces, natural forces, geology, geo geomorphology, should come here and have a look. It is seen better than in, in many, many textbooks. After days of diving and trying to convince Wolf, even with a professor of geology on my side, I realize that I'm going to have to explore other clues if I'm going to persuade skeptics that these structures point to a missing chapter in man's prehistory. I need to continue the search on land for signs of a megalithic culture that could go back to the end of the Ice Age. Geologists can't agree whether the underwater monuments around Yonaguni are natural structures or whether they were made by humans. But no one's yet thought to inquire whether Japan has a tradition of carving huge monuments in rock. I've started investigating Shinto, Japan's unique faith because I've discovered that an important aspect of Shinto is the worship of stone and large rocks. Shinto venerates natural forces as spirits called kami. The wind, the ocean, trees, rocks, mountains, all are believed to be possessed by kami. This Shinto shrine is beneath Mount Miwa, a sacred mountain, and itself a kami. In ancient times, heaven and earth were not separate. This was all nature. I think we have to, to remember what the word kami in, in Japanese really means. Kami goes back to a pre-Chinese character, pre-era of Japanese history. 
that kind of spirit that can be ascribed to anything unusual. But the biggest clue from Mount Miwa is that this prehistoric fascination with the unusual in nature led the ancient Japanese to modify great rock formations as Iwakura, sacred godstones. They're revered and bound with sacred ropes. Some are entirely natural, others have been shaped by man. How long have megalithic structures like these been venerated in Japan? What they remind me of are some of the unusual arrangements of rocks that I've seen underwater at Yonaguni. Perhaps geologists can argue about whether they're natural or man-made because they're both. Unusual rocks shaped by man, just like the megalithic shrines on Mount Miwa except the underwater rocks were last above water 10,000 years ago. And I found another, even more striking parallel between the Yonaguni monument and a rock shrine. It's known as Masudano Iwafune, the rock boat of Masuda. Like so many of the great megaliths in Japan, its origins are completely obscure and mysterious. We see a combination of beautiful, clean-cut straight edges and rough, unfinished stone. Here, we see a structure which is definitely man-made. What that suggests to me is that that kind of combination is part of the Japanese megalithic tradition, as far back into the past as it goes. The similarity in stone-cutting technique with Yonaguni, which has been submerged for thousands of years, is evidence suggesting the tradition could go back to the end of the Ice Age. I found megaliths all around the Asuka Valley clustered into a few square miles, just as at Yonaguni. My guess is that in both places, the ancient artists found form in rock. And when they could, they would enhance that form to give it meaning and shape. Excited by these finds, which bolster the case for Yonaguni being man-made, I'm making another dive here. To take the search deeper, I join a group of divers working there with a remotely operated vehicle. The ROV can go down below the main monument to a depth of 400 feet to look for new evidence on the entire area which was once land at the end of the Ice Age. Since no marine archaeologists have ever studied this structure, I've asked Sri Sundaresh to join us. He's an experienced archaeologist from the Indian National Institute of Oceanography. What is that over this little hill? Focus closer. Can we turn the ROV to the right? The plan is for the ROV to spend the next week searching the seabed for unusual structures. Sundaresh and I will check in on the operation from time to time, but our part of the expedition will be to focus on the underwater structures that have already been discovered around Yonaguni. I start by showing Sundaresh some of the controversial features that have fueled the debate. First we proceed along what I think is the base pathway in front of the main monument at Iseki Point. A miracle of nature, as the German geologist Wolf Wichmann describes it, or the work of man. 
And what about the great steps? Cut out of the bedrock by waves, leaving no debris on the path below? Or cut by humans before the seas rose? ECK point, the structure is more than 300 meters in length and then about 23 meter in height. Probably the way that uh, structure was made by cutting existing rock, that must have acted as a harbor. A harbor? Cutting the rock? So the first marine archaeologist ever to see Yonaguni thinks it's man-made. In some places, three places I have observed, a person can easily go down till bottom and he can climb up. Because in between there are some small steps also, about half meter in height. Definitely that is a man-made. It's not a, I don't think it's uh, natural. Sundaresh's imaginative concept of a harbour certainly makes sense of the steps and the path which could have been a channel for boats when the water level was lower. We planned three dives the next day to check this idea out further. As we're about to make the first dive, we get a typhoon warning. It seems not one, but three typhoons are heading straight for Yonaguni. We run for the shelter of the modern harbor. We've just had these faxes in. There's a chance that this typhoon might move to the north and miss Yonaguni. They take typhoons very seriously here. Boats can be smashed and thrown out of the water if not properly secured. Our dive boat is carefully moored in the inner harbour. What we're catching is the edge of the typhoon. If that typhoon comes directly over the island, then the whole expedition is going to be scrubbed. So we're just praying that it's going to slip by us and give us fair weather tomorrow. The worst that we feared has happened. Two huge storm systems have merged and the eye of the storm is passing right over Yonaguni. The waves are already going mad. The local people tell us within two or three hours those waves are going to be driven by 100 mile an hour wind and will pass right over the top of us. Everybody in town is battened down. We've had to abort the expedition. Even the ROV exploration can't be completed. <laughs> Trying to prove my case that the Japanese underwater structures are man-made vestiges of an Ice Age civilization, I took my investigation in a new direction the Japanese people themselves, and their myths. My research has convinced me that myths can survive literally thousands of years handed down by word of mouth. One central myth of Shinto, venerated at shrines and celebrated on special days, speaks of the restoration of light after darkness. I've been following just such myths in the Atlantic and India, myths that speak of great floods that hark back to the end of the Ice Age. In the Shinto myth, the god of the sea encroaches on previously planted lands, upsetting nature. The sun goddess is so offended by his destructive acts that she retreats into a small, rocky cave. As she vanishes from sight, darkness covers the earth. The other gods, distraught, try to lure her out of the cave so the world can be saved. They create a massive commotion with music and revels. And when curiosity gets the better of her and she emerges, they use a mirror to dazzle her with her own reflection. 
while they close up the cave forever. The sun shines in the sky. Light is restored to the world. I think the story of the myth could be a metaphor for real events. Geology shows that while its coastlines were being flooded at the end of the Ice Age, changing loads on the Earth's crust sparked off volcanic chain reactions in Japan, darkening the skies for decades and perhaps bringing on a kind of nuclear winter. The imagery of the myth, with the sun disappearing into a rocky cave, is commemorated in Japan today by the sacred stones or Iwakura we've already seen. Iwakura is related to the small cave. Our ancestors lived in the cave. And uh, also the goddess. Sun goddess, goddess. yes. The, when something happened, she hide in the cave. And the world became dark. Yeah. The rope or the, the sacred streamers are a kind of reminder of the locking of the door so that the, the sacred god cannot go hide again. But is it possible that there were people here who experienced the terrors of the end of the Ice Age and left a record in myth? In most parts of the world, we know little or nothing about who was around at the end of the Ice Age. But Japan's an exception. It was inhabited by an ancient people whose sites have been excavated all over these islands. The oldest dating back to 16,000 years ago. Archaeologists call them the Jomon. Every great human culture has something special, something that it does better than anybody else. For the Egyptians, it was the pyramids. For the Greeks, the representation of the human form. And for the Jomon of Japan, it was pottery. Here's the mystery. The Jomon were a supposedly primitive hunter-gatherer culture. And yet they were the first people in the world to make pottery. Thousands of years earlier than any other culture known to archaeologists. Their pottery representations of the human figure called dogu express a fantastic and wonderful artistic sensibility. These strange and wonderful representations of the human form, sometimes half beast, half man. If we were to judge the Jomon purely in terms of their economic lifestyle, we would tend to say this is a rather primitive hunter-gatherer people. But when we look at their art, we hear a different story. We truly don't understand the Jomon people. We know a lot of what you would call basic data. We have lots of figurines. What they mean, we don't know. What's so special about the Jomon? We certainly don't have the whole story and never will. That's the fun part of it. We don't even have all the facts, I'm sure. Uh, I'm not sure the exact number of Jomon sites. Roughly 150,000 Jomon sites. Probably half of them excavated to some extent. Millions and millions of pots, and they're just everywhere. Rarely do you see two pots that look much alike. Every time you dig a Jomon site, you find something that hasn't been found before. I've come to Sanai Muriyama in northern Japan. What they found here takes us way beyond pottery. It's considered so important to Japanese prehistory that a complete reconstruction has now been built. Discovered in 1995, it's a place that's forcing archaeologists to revise their views of the Jomon. What effect did it have on archaeological thinking about the level of Jomon culture? 
Before San Amuriyama was discovered, people had thought of the Jomon as primitive hunters, living a very basic life. But after the discovery, opinion changed. Archaeologists realized that the Jomon people were much more complex. Here they've reconstructed a huge monument which demonstrates that Jomon had a shrewd understanding of maths and astronomy as far back as 5,000 years ago. Professor Kobayashi has studied how the Jomon created a calendar. The point of sunset and sun rising was an exact calendar for Jomon people. They construct the monument to the special day. Uh, many people gathered and had feast. The sun would rise in the east mm -hmm. at the summer solstice. Professor Kobayashi explains how the posts are exactly aligned to mark Midsummer's Day. Just noontime yes. uh, of the special day of uh, Midsummer, yes. the shadow yes. between the corridor. The shadows from the posts exactly divide the base of the structure at midday on Midsummer's Day. It's highly unlikely to be a coincidence. And it tells us that the Jomon must have had a very long background building large, precisely oriented structures before they built this one. At Yonaguni, astronomical calculations show that the structure stood on a very significant latitude. It would have been exactly on the ancient Tropic of Cancer, a circle around the northern half of the Earth connecting all the points where the sun stands directly overhead at midday on the summer solstice. The ancient Jomon interest in the sun could provide a rational motive for such a massive work. In my travels, I found an extraordinary ancient people, the Jomon, and phenomenal underwater structures equally ancient. What I'm looking for is a more tangible link to bind them together. And I think I've found it. Professor Keeley told me about a little known phenomenon, stone circles. Sometimes the circles are of very large diameter. Sometimes they're smaller circles put together like the links of a chain. And sometimes they use megaliths. Komakino looks like a miniature amphitheater. It happens to be on a minor slope, so you have the circle. But the hillside actually looks like the seats in a stadium. A very interesting layout. What they are, I don't know. Do you go in there and dance in the circle? No evidence of bonfires. It's going to take an awful lot more study. This custom of building stone circles has only been traced back amongst the Jomon to about 5,000 years ago. But I think I found evidence on the seabed of a spectacular hidden ancestry to the Jomon stone circles. It's at another underwater site that I've been exploring 200 miles north of Yonaguni, off the Kerama Islands. It's a strange feeling for me. If I was underwater now, I could easily be amongst the stone circles of Kerama. Small circles made of river pebbles, exactly like these, that bear the unmistakable imprint of the Jomon. Up north, they have these very clear stone circles. And of course, a lot of the speculation is uh, they're burials, they're sundials, they're related to the solstices, the uh, equinoxes. It's one of these things that could be right, but it still looks more like a guess to me. But what I realized as I came to Oshoro is that all the stone circles are built close to the coast. 
With a diameter of 33 meters, that's about 100 feet, Oshoro is the largest Jomon stone circle so far discovered above water. This circle is thought to be about 4,000 years old. But 10,000 years ago, when we know the Jomon were active, any circles built near the coast would now be underwater. That's exactly the situation with the stone circles that I found at Kerama. Sites with the good artifacts might well be coastal. As the oceans have risen, the sites that we really need to find are underwater. That's a very likely possibility. The great submerged circle lies about three miles offshore of the nearest of the Kerama Islands. But it was a few kilometers inland before 10,000 years ago. Sea levels were much lower then, and Kerama was connected to the main island of Okinawa. If Kerama is a Jomon site 10,000 years old, then that would require us to consider the Jomon as a civilized people when there's supposed to have been no civilization. But still, there's one big problem. Geologists like Wolf Witchman, who don't believe the underwater structures can be man-made at all. This is extremely strange. It is. The stone is hanging over the sky. Over the edge. Kept very crazy. Now it's time to put Kerama on trial, and I brought my arch-skeptic Wolf to deliver his verdict. Kerama's a tricky dive. There's only a slim window of opportunity in the lull between raging currents. And frankly, I'm nervous as we jump in. But not because of the currents. The deep blue water is calm. My nerves are about what Wolf's going to make of this place. Because no matter how good the evidence for a Jomon link to the stone circle may be, I know that no one's going to take it seriously if a marine geologist tells me it's a totally natural structure. We drop down over the base of the circle, 90 feet underwater. There's a labyrinth of side passages branching amongst the forest of adjoining uprights. Returning to the central pillar, it's striking how the base of the first ring of uprights surrounding it have concave curves that exactly parallel its convex perimeter. They seem very smooth and flat where they disappear into the pebbles of the surrounding path. By scraping off the marine growth on the pillars and hammering out a sample, Wolf discovers that they're ancient coralline limestone from which many megalithic structures around the world are made. I wonder what natural force Wolf is going to tell me cut and match these parallel curves. It is completely made of coralline limestone. So you see the structures yes. of the animals. Yes. Yeah. I, I have definitely no explanation for these for, for these, the circles. For the circles and for the structures, how they came how they came in. Yeah. I don't see any force which would which could have shaped these. Any force of nature which could shape that. Yes, of course. Yeah. I mean So that leaves at us the moment, at that the leaves moment, us so. with one option then. I don't know. I, I would I would not be so go you I would not go so, so far. I mean it's very fast and you have to do very, a lot of research Agreed. on doing that. Agreed. So you have to, to I may have got Wolf to yield a notch on this one, but I have to agree with him that there's still a lot of research to do at Karama. There's the mystery of the huge rock-cut circle and of its relationship to the smaller circles made of river stones. And to this strange arched shrine that lies a few hundred feet to the northwest. Because when we lift the veil of the sea, we discover that they're all part of what seems to be a gigantic complex of planned monuments. Not the haphazard results of natural forces, but the work of human beings. We may be on the trail of a lost Ice Age civilization, but will others take the search further? You and your team here have done continuous research for some years, but almost nobody else is working on it, I think. 
in Japanese uh, scientists cannot dive. That's a problem. <laughs> Until scientists dive the vast areas of land swallowed up by the Ice Age floods, evidence will continue to be scarce. Thanks to individual divers, we now know of a growing number of underwater ruins scattered all around the world. In Japan, more flooded structures continue to be found, straddling the Tropic of Cancer. Karama, Yonaguni. The latest discovery is between Taiwan and China. Here, two towering walls cross each other at right angles underwater, running east-west and north-south. That they're man-made is confirmed by polygonal masonry blocks visible in broken sections. And geological studies confirm that this area was above water until the end of the Ice Age. I think of it as just one underworld amongst many that wait unexplored in all the world's oceans. I've tried to draw attention to what might be out there and just how old it might be. But for me, it's not only about dates. It's about what civilization means. Does it mean stability of culture? The Jomon expressed their own unique form of civilization for 14,000 years. Does it mean cities? We've seen two huge cities at the bottom of the Gulf of Cambay in northwest India. 4,000 years older than any other cities known to archaeologists. Does it mean great monuments? We've seen colossal monuments beneath the sea around the coasts of Japan, off southeast India, in the waters of Malta. Such monuments hint at highly organized human societies that flourished along coastlines all around the world at the end of the Ice Age. I think the evidence is mounting that we've badly underestimated our ancestors. I think we could have made the leap to civilization at least once before, and then have been set back by terrible natural calamities, just as all the flood myths of antiquity testify. And I think it's highly possible, as Plato says, that after the cataclysms we had to begin again like children with no memory of what went before. In this series, I've tried to show how many of the clues that might help us to remember are lost underwater, as the flood myths predict. And that what gapes at our doorstep, where the land ends and the sea begins, is a vast, uncharted underworld that we've ignored for far too long.